civil engineering with our the college of engineering mysore uh, today signing in as master of ceremony for webinar on non destructive testing of concrete structures by dr s raviraj professor of civil engineering shri jay chamarajar college of engineering jss science and technology university mysore in argi this webinar is organized in connection with the birthday celebration of eminent structural engineer ekin fig now to begin with i request our beloved hod dr sk prasad sir to welcome today's speaker and the participant to this webinar or to you sir good morning everybody so today is another great day for me because uh, another excellent friend of mine professor s raviraj is going to make a presentation on non destructive tests in concrete structures well friends uh, i have two important duties to perform the first one is to welcome everybody and then i just would like to speak a little about my institution and the department i am extremely happy to mention that you know this is the 23rd webinar which we are organizing from 1st of june which means you know we are having almost two webinars every week and each of these webinars have been class so we have the appreciation from everybody that they have gone excellently well first of all i need to welcome uh, my good friend professor s raviraj professor at sri jay chamarajendra college of engineering he has been you know mm, a, a excellent uh, teacher uh, very disciplinarian very much liked by the students and i uh, deem it my pleasure to welcome you professor raviraj to this thank webinar. you thank you prasad uh, secondly i have to welcome all the participants so we have had participants from all over the country and even from outside the country so participants are from you know uh, academics the students some of them are researchers and some of them are working professionals and all of you have given lot of uh, encouragement to us by mentioning that the webinars you have attended are excellent i am extremely sure that this webinar will also be like that and i welcome each one of you for this webinar lastly i need need to welcome my dynamic colleagues from the department of civil engineering at vidyavardhan college of engineering so all these big activities have been possible because of the dynamism because of the energy shown by each one of uh, my colleagues so i again you know feel very happy to welcome both teaching and non teaching colleagues of my uh, you know vidyavardhan college of engineering the second part of my uh, talk will be on uh, uh, you know uh, 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 about my institution and the department i don't need to mention vidyavardhaka college of engineering is definitely one of the most popular uh, engineering colleges in the state of karnataka situated in the heart of city of mysore it is popular among students parents and even other different kinds of uh, stakeholders so it is not just popular it is popular because of you know uh, the credentials it has it has become autonomous from this year under btu it is a nac accredited institution with ea grade all its departments have been accredited by nba secondly i would like to talk about my department so department at present comprises of 16 very disciplined very well read and student friendly teachers from all disciplines of civil engineering i'm very happy to mention that the average age is less than 35 which means you know we have many youngsters in the department and we have an excellent teacher student uh, uh, you know ratio uh, 
which is better than you know one is to fifty. We have excellent uh, laboratory facilities. We have a very good seminar hall, a computer center, and we are equipped with everything, including the department library with around two thousand uh, you know um, books. So I always, you know, welcome you people to, you know, come to our department, have discussions with us, have interactions with us. And hence, you know, now I'm happy to invite uh, my good friend, Professor Raviraj, to speak on NDD in concrete structures. And before that, I hand over the mic to the MC of the day, Professor Rajit. Rajit, please. Thank you, sir. I also welcome to this webinar, sir. Now, I request uh, Professor P. K. Omisha, sir, to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor S. Raviraj. Over to you, Omisha, sir. Good morning. Good morning, one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's eminent speaker, Dr. S. Raviraj. Dr. S. Raviraj is currently working as a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at Sri Jaya Chamarajendra College of Engineering, that is the JSS Science and Technology University, Mysore. Dr. Raviraj completed a BE degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Mysore during 1984, securing a third rank M.Tech degree in Structural Engineering from Karnataka Regional Engineering College, Suratkar. Presently, it is called NITK in 1987. And he has completed his Ph.D. degree in 2009 from Kuempu University. Dr. Raviraj worked as a design engineer in CMAC Consulting Engineers, Bangalore during 1987. Later, he joined SJCE in 1988 as lecturer in the Department of Civil Engineering. He is now, he is actively involved in teaching, research, consultancy, and many other, <coughs> more than three decades. He has guided uh, two PhD students and presently guiding four PhD students. He has guided more than uh, 80 MTech students in structural engineering for their dissertation work. He has uh, published uh, more than 20 technical papers in international and national journals and conferences. His area of research include material technology, fracture mechanics of concrete, reliability analysis of structures, finite element analysis. Dr. Raviraj has delivered many technical talks in EDUSAT and e Siksha programs of VTU Belgaum. Continuing education programs organized by Karnataka Engineering Research Stations for government officials and also at uh, other premier institutions. He, has, uh, he was honored with uh, Dakshina Kesari Best Engineer Award in 2017 by Lions Club of uh, Mysore South during September 2017. He has uh, visited Arizona State University, USA, Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, on technical assignment. Dr. Raviraj is a member of boards of studies, boards of exams, and many other of many other auto autonomous engineering colleges. He has organized many national and uh, international uh, conferences and seminars. He is a member of uh, many professional bodies like uh, ACCE, Institution of Engineers, Indian Concrete Institute, Indian Geotechnical Society, and Indian Society of Technical Education. And he, he, he was a former secretary of ACC Mysore, Mysore Center, and currently he is a managing committee member of ACC Mysore Center. This is a brief introduction of Dr. Raviraj. Thank you, sir, for being with us. I once again welcome you, sir. Now over to Professor Rajit. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. OK, sir, thank you. Thank you, uh, um, uh, Professor Umesh, sir. So before we start with, I have a few announcements to make. The e-certificate will be provided to those who participate in the webinar on submitting the feedback. The feedback link will be posted 
in all uh, in only in youtube chat box and the link will be active up to 3 pm today the participants can post their queries in youtube chat box and will clarify at the end of the session so now we are celebrating uh, the birthday of our eminent structural engineer eugene fake uh, as of that now i request professor giris sir to brief Hello. about our works and Hello. achievements of engineer or to giris sir good morning today we have webinar on iterative testing of computers to celebrate the birthday of Eugene Fake. Eugene Fake was born on August 4, 1936, in Charleston, South Carolina, United States. He received engineering as a structural engineer from Chicago in Charleston in the year 1958. Eugene Fake made numerous contributions to the field of structural engineering, especially in the design of paper state grids and the use of experimental concrete construction methods. He formed his own engineering firm, the Fit Engineering Group, which is still operating. He also founded the American Segmental Trade Institute in the year 1989. He served four years as a trustee at National Public Museum. In the year 2000, Sikh was awarded with the John Smith Group in Metal for his Einstein Einstein achievement in credit engineering. Thank you. Over to us. Thank you, Kirit sir. So with this note, I would like to hand over the session to today's speaker. And now I request Professor Severa sir to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Rajit. Okay, uh, uh, is my uh, slide uh, visible? Yes, sir, it's visible, sir. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I am very happy to be associated uh, with the series of webinar being conducted by the civil department at uh, Vidyavardhaka College of Engineering. I am happy to note that uh, this is the 23rd uh, webinar that they are organizing Okay, since June 1st of this particular year. I uh, wish to congratulate uh, the entire team headed by Dr. S.K. Prasad and the young team of uh, the Department of Civil Engineering at VBCE and also the management of uh, VBCE for supporting this kind of uh, knowledge dissemination. Uh, this is a very uh, 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 good kind of uh, uh, Celebration, celebration where you are trying to uh, uh, conduct these kind of seminars in the name of uh, eminent engineers. And today, uh, I am very happy to be associated with this particular uh, uh, engineer, that is Dr. Yugin Fig. Uh, anyway, I would also would like to dedicate uh, this pr presentation to many such eminent structural engineers and also uh, the people who have worked in the area of non-destructive testing of concrete. Now, as we all know, concrete is a very common construction material. It is common because of many factors like it can be easily made with the local, locally available materials and uh, it's easy to uh, produce concrete and uh, one excellent property of this particular material is it has good ability to resist water okay it's water resistant so till it hardens yeah we have to take care of it so once it hardens yeah it can bear any kind of uh, uh, resistance is what uh, we can in general feel about uh, if you just try to understand the 
quantity of concrete that is being processed okay in this planet it is quite huge if i try to give some numbers it's been said that it's more than 20 trillion kgs of concrete is being produced annually and maybe it comes to something like more than 50 billion kgs per day okay it's quite a huge quantity or if i try to say that it is the largest consumed material by humans next to water in this particular planet so the most important thing that we need to understand here is when we are trying to consume this material to that large extent we are also trying to spend a lot of energy to produce this material and it's good that we try to do all justice to the material so that we get a good product okay once we try to do this if you just try to check this kind of structures that are being built by concrete you can understand okay we have varied kind of structures okay that are being uh, constructed okay and uh, we need to really be careful that none of these structures okay are having any kind of ill effects in the sense in respect to quality so testing of concrete structures is an integral part of production of or, uh, or uh, yeah, building concrete structures. The objective is obviously to have good quality for the structures. And uh, one thing we need to understand here is uh, just trying to uh, take a good uh, material will not ensure okay good quality concrete. Okay, so what you need to understand is the know-how of trying to make concrete is equally important to get good concrete. Anyway, sometimes, okay, we also would like to get into situations where we would like to check the quality of the structures. And the best way of trying to do that would be using non-destructive testing procedures or methods. These are very ideal because when we do these kind of testing, it does not really damage the structure. But there could be situations where we have to slightly damage the surface, which will be made good immediately to know the quality of the concrete. And such tests are generally called as semi-destructive tests are partly destructive tests. Now these tests can be performed both on new and old concrete structures. So new obviously, okay, just to know the kind of quality has been ensured, it has been consistent at all places. Okay, so we all we, we try to do that. Okay, so we need to ensure things are all right. Okay, the new when when we are trying to uh, uh, build a new structure. However, in case of old structures, Okay, so the issues could be many and we would like to do a test on these structures to know that the quality of the concrete is uh, uh, to what extent the, the quality of the concrete exists in those kind of structures. So generally this is applicable to both new and old concrete structures. And the range of properties. Okay, one second. Okay, the range of properties of concrete determined from NDT is very large. So when I mean range of properties, it could include many things like compressive strength, density, surface hardness, carbonation, reinforcement details which are embedded inside the concrete structure, extent of corrosion of reinforcement bars, etc. I'm not saying these are the only things that we are trying to uh, find out in non destructive testing. I'm just trying to give you some glimpse, okay, that we can try to uh, find of the properties that we can find in concrete. Fortunately, we have a wide range of instruments, okay, which has made it possible for the experts to determine the quality of the concrete and suggest appropriate solutions. 
So one thing that we need to understand here is, okay, the process of conducting the non-destructive testing and the remedy that we need to uh, take up to uh, 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 rectify the problems in concrete is quite huge in the sense it's very time consuming. It's it's very uh, uh, the, the process is complex. Okay, it, it, the, the cost is quite high. So the best way is to avoid getting into situations where we are forced to carry out some remedial measures. Okay, which would be in terms of repair, restoration, rehabilitation, etc. Okay, to see that the quality of the concrete is made good. Okay, so as far as possible, if we do our homework properly, okay, before concreting and at the time of concreting, okay, we can avoid these expensive kind of uh, uh, procedures. Now, introduction to NDD, that is, if we just try to talk about definition, it can be briefly stated as the use of non-invasive techniques to determine the integrity of a material, component or structure or quantitatively measure some characteristic of an object. Or in short, we can also say it's nothing but inspect or measure without doing any harm. So this could be a very concise definition of non-destructive testing of concrete. Now, non-destruct testing of concrete structure is not new. It's been there since more than seven decades. If you look at the literature, okay, methods, different methods of NDT are being described, okay, even in those periods. But important to understand that considerable developments have, have taken place since these the since these period since this period and the new inventions and developments are taking place and what we are using today okay will definitely become obsolete okay in the next decade because the kind of development that is happening especially in these kind of areas is so fast okay that the the instruments okay that we are using today will become quite obsolete tomorrow that is the kind of process so if you just try to check the mobile phones that we have here you understand so how soon okay the mobile phone phones or smartphones okay are changing so even in ndt the instruments that we are trying to use are also being updated and we have to use these new instruments to know or to get the properties of the concrete in a much better way. NDT is considered to be a very powerful method to evaluate uh, the quality of structures. It could be strength and durability. And what we are talking about at this point, time, point of time is the hardened properties of concrete. It's important to understand that if I describe these methods, yeah, it looks very simple to perform, but generally okay an experienced person or an expert can easily analyze and interpret the results that is obtained okay once we do these kind of tests so anyway okay so it's always better that we try to get these tests done by experts okay and then try to know the kind of uh, properties that we have in the concrete now in general Okay, so any test that we try to talk about, we try to measure some characteristic. Okay, is what you need to understand. And we try to interpret that, okay, or try to use it to estimate the quality, strength, durability, and other properties. So what you need to understand is the test will not give you straight away the desired property. Like for example, I want to calculate compressive strength. So I don't use it. Uh, to get directly the compressive strength. So I'll be giving, getting some, some, some characteristic value, okay, some property, okay, and some number or whatever it is, which will be interpreted 
to assess the quality of the concrete. Now, situations of using NDT are many. I've tried to describe some important situations like to know the, uh, to control the quality during the construction or in pre-cost units, okay, to locate and determine the extent of uh, cracks, voids, honeycombs, or any other defects within the concrete structure. Okay, to determine the uniformity in concrete. And uh, it's important to do this basically because sometimes if things are not good, it's not uniform, there's a problem. We always have to go for, okay, semi-destructive tests. Uh, but before we straight away do semi-destructive test, we should have ensured that there's a serious problem, okay, or some justifiable uh, uh, case okay to use semi-destructive tests and to do that okay this non-destructive tests are very very important okay to determine the position quantity uh, or condition of the reinforcement okay conforming or locating suspected deterioration of concrete which could be due to very many factors like overloading fatigue chemical attack fire etc assess the potential durability of the concrete okay and monitor the long-term changes in concrete properties so these are some situations where we can try to use NDT I'm not saying these are the only situations these are some of the situations that NDT can be made use of regarding methodology it's quite simple so we have different methods okay in NDT which are called as general purpose methods or methods designed for specific purpose. Okay, it depends on what exactly is the problem. Based on that, you can choose any of this and narrow down the areas where we need to carry out more detailed inspection. So once we understand where exactly things have deteriorated, so we can understand the mechanism of deterioration, understand why this has happened and to what extent the deterioration has taken place using the uh, methods. And then, okay, that is find out the extent of deterioration and then specify appropriate method for remedial measures. So anyway, it's quite simple. Okay, but please understand to do this, the process is very complicated. Okay, though the steps here are quite simple, the process is complicated. The sense it's time consuming and it's very very expensive or costly now let me just try to take you through some of the standard non-destructive tests that are normally performed like the reborn hammer test the ultrasonic pulse velocity test the rebar locator test the corrosion analysis test the concrete resistivity meter test the impact echo test the surface penetration radar test and X-ray computed topography. So these are some of the tests that uh, we are trying to uh, discuss or in this particular presentation. Now coming to some semi-destructive tests, it could be the standard concrete core test, the capo test, which is nothing but cut and pull out test, the Windsor probe test, load test on structures, carbonation test, chloride test, sulfate determination test, and determination of pH. So let me just try to take you through these different tests that we have here. Please understand that it's very difficult for us to do justice, okay, in detail for all these particular tests, but nevertheless, I will attempt to make you understand the most important aspects of these tests so that if you're interested you can spend more time okay with respect to literature and understanding now there are different types of reborn hammers available in the market okay for example you've got type n which is a general uh, normal purpose uh, reborn hammer uh, which is normally used for ordinary buildings and bridge constructions an important part of the reborn hammer is a spring okay which generally compresses okay once you operate this the, the hammer which stores energy and then it the, this energy is used to push a hammer mass okay along a guide bar which hits 
okay a, a rod which is in contact with the concrete surface and then rebounds correct so that is why please understand in each of these rebound hammers we are talking about impact energy so the impact energy in type n is 2.207 newton meter we just try to check quickly here so there are two persons standing here okay so one person is trying to take a reading okay on the concrete uh, component here and another person is trying to record the reading now this is type nr which has a special recording device and if you just try to see in the picture there is only one person who is trying to operate this particular instrument in the sense that there is uh, uh, no necessary of another person to assist okay him while doing the test that is nr is nothing but r stands for special recording device so these are some other types of uh, remote hammers available like where you are trying to see in this window okay the the uh, ribbon number is displayed in digital format whereas in the previous one okay it is just an unlock format where you have to just read values so we have what is called as tight l this is generally uh, used for very thin wall where the thickness is very small less than 100 mm or small components okay since you cannot use the previous hammer because it has an impact energy of something like 2.205 whereas this is very less 0.735 so it can be used for these kind of structures like for example look at this this is a person okay so who's trying to take a, an impact okay on test on on uh, thin pipes so please understand if we use type n here instead of type l okay a part of the energy is used for vibrating okay this component and uh, the entire energy is not available for the rebound okay so you need to understand that okay uh, there is specific type of rebound hammers are used for specific situations okay this is again another kind of hammer lb okay so it's specifically for burnt clay materials and tile products so this is type m okay where the impact energy is quite high 29.43 maybe around some 13 times more than type n generally used for mass concrete or even for concrete road pavements and airfield runways okay so this is a type P pendulum hammer where it is used to test mortar joints of brick walls, plaster works and surfacings. Okay, you can clearly see, okay, there is a swing pendulum. Okay, you have to adjust it properly so that it comes and hits the joint, okay, the mortar joint and then we get a rebound. Now, I would be more uh, specifically concentrating on uh, type N, which is a general purpose rebound hammer. It's also called as squid hammer right and uh, this was invented by a swiss engineer ernst smith and hence this name okay is attributed to him okay now please understand this is uh, um, supplied in a very attractive case so you can clearly see the hammer and the circle that we have here red circle so you can clearly see that the plunger has been retracted that is it's inside the body of the hammer so you have also this uh, uh, stone carborundum stone which will be supplied along with the instrument okay which will be generally used to smoothen the surface on which we are trying to do the test so this is a, a typical uh, uh, specification of this particular type in hammer so it is possible to uh, 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 use this particular instrument on concrete ranging out strength range from 10 to 70 megapascals impact energy okay 2.207 important thing weight is very small 1.6 kg so any uh, average person can try to use this particular instrument and you have a code okay connected with this that is one double three double one part two right now regarding testing principle it's quite simple uh, it's it's important to understand that the first thing that we have to do is this uh, a plunger which is retracted has to be first released so we need to just try to take this hammer press it on any a hard surface and then it comes out okay and the hammer is ready for test correct so it's quite simple we just try to take it okay on uh, keep it on normal perpendicular to any hard surface then apply gentle pressure on, the, on from your back of the palm and then you just try to just uh, you hear a clicking sound and then the uh, 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 once you just try to take out the hammer okay the uh, plunger is out and it's ready for testing so before we do the test, the first thing that we have to do is we have to take this carbonum stone and smoothen the test surface. It's important to understand that we are not testing the plaster. Okay, we are testing the concrete. So any plaster 
that is applied on the concrete surface should be first removed and then the surface should be smoothened using this cart random stone and then we just try to take this hammer keep it perpendicular to the surface and then just start applying gentle pressure from the back of your palm as shown here okay till the plunger completely retracts and then at one point of time okay the, the uh, once the spring has compressed to the maximum extent right you hear okay uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, i mean uh, the the hammer is being released so it just comes and hits this particular plunger right and then rebounds correct so we have to understand that you can clearly see there's a slit uh, at this point of time and we need to take a reading on the slit okay just uh, take a reading and that indicates the height of rebound so this is a typical cross section of the rebound hammer so what the spring i was talking about the impact spring okay is in this particular portion and the hammer i was talking about was this one which guides along this particular bar okay and and uh, initially this hammer will be locked okay in this but uh, in this particular position okay it's, it, it it gets slides and then hits this particular portion which is in contact with the concrete surface and then rebounds once this rebounds please understand it takes the rider okay that you are seeing at the top okay on this picture okay to some extent and all you're supposed to do is through this window okay where there's a scale okay you have to just find out to what extent the rebound the hammer has rebounded it's a very simple process anybody can try now here the maximum height of rebound is recorded on 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 the scale that is window scale and this is converted to a compressive strength using a conversion table which is generally affixed this chart is affixed on the body of the instrument so this is the uh, uh, chart that we are trying to talk about okay which can be made use of to convert the rebound number to compressive strength so the x axis here okay starting from 20 and up to 20, 55 in this uh, chart shows you the rebound number okay and the y axis gives you the compressive strength that we are trying to convert that we are trying to get now there are three lines that you can see over here that indicates the position from the hammer okay that you are trying to have during the test so please understand that if the uh, horizontal the, the uh, I mean, uh, hammer is horizontally horizontal in position you are trying to test a vertical surface if the uh, uh, hammer if the surface is uh, horizontal that is i mean you are trying to test it on the roof okay the hammer is in this position that is it's downward okay if trying to test the underside of the roof okay the hammer is upwards this is this is the kind of uh, uh, position so depending upon how you are holding the hammer please understand you will be using that appropriate curve for example okay i am i'm trying to test a, the surface of a column which is vertical so my position of the hammer is horizontal so assuming that i have a reading of something like 35 here i just go up intersect this particular line and move towards left and i'm trying to say that the probable strength of the concrete is 34 megapascals okay right and if you just try to come to the right please understand there is a standard deviation also which you can pick up okay from the corresponding value okay which uh, could be something like it is 6.7 plus or minus uh, 6 plus or minus 6.7 megapascals so you need to understand that ndt gives you okay a range of uh, the possibility of the strength okay the, the, the strength being in that particular uh, range is what you need to understand correct so it's a very simple process that that uh, we can understand so these are some pictures where okay uh, persons are trying to perform the test so always the hammer should be held normal to the surface of the test okay a person trying to do the test on the top of roof surface so this is for a cube so when you're doing a test on a concrete cube you need to understand that the concrete cube should be fixed in the sense you have to apply some minimum load okay on the concrete specimen you have to lock it so that the mass of the uh, I mean, uh, cube increases and then once you take a rebound right it does not uh, disturb that means it's held in position okay so to build up the mass before you try to do the test so these are some standard established procedures which you can understand so these are different types of uh, rebound hammers available in the market and you need to understand that there are very many factors which influence the test results for example if you are talking about mixed characteristics right from cement type cement content coarse 
type aggregates, what type of uh, aggregate you're trying to talk about. Is it soft or hard? All those things do matter. Regarding the member characteristics, it is a mass. Is it a thin member or thick member? Does it vibrate? Compaction adopted in concrete, surface type, age, rate of hardening, curing type, surface carbonation, moisture condition, wet, dry, st uh, stress state and temperature. So there are many characteristics that will influence. Some will have uh, a higher effect, some will have a lower effect. So you need to understand an expert will try to record all these uh, things at the site. Okay, and then try to uh, holistically take uh, a, an opinion with respect to estimating the, the, the strength of the concrete with some deviation. Right? Now, it's important to note that, uh, as I was trying to tell you, the integral part or the important part of a rebound hammer is uh, the, the spring. And once we try to use this particular hammer periodically, the stiffness of the spring may reduce. If the stiffness of the spring reduces, the energy reduces. And if the energy reduces, Okay, please understand. Okay, the 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 uh, uh, the height of rebound obviously will also reduce, and we may get a wrong answer, right, or wrong rebound number. Okay, if you are using a spring with less stiffness, correct. So we have to check the uh, efficiency of the rebound hammer using uh, what is called as a calibrating device. It's a steel anvil. You need to understand that's a small depression. Okay, at that particular point, and we need to just place the rebound hammer in vertical position, okay, right at this particular point and take a rebound number. So we have some standard values, it could be 80 plus or minus 2 or something like that, okay, or any other standard number that we are trying to get, okay, and uh, that, that will be written on the anvil. And once uh, you, you are satisfied with those numbers, you can use your rebound hammer for testing. If not, you have to just try to take it to the vendor or the supplier and then try to uh, uh, make good okay or rectify the the spring okay uh, with a good one okay and then continue the test otherwise okay the reliability of the test will suffer okay and uh, it's important to understand that generally okay when you do testing in the laboratory okay moist cubes will definitely offer less a 10 percent about 10 to 15 percent less strength than tested in uh, dry state but please understand, when we do non-destructive testing, all the calibrations that we were trying to talk about have been done in dry state, have been run in dry state. Okay, so the calibration charts have been obtained, okay, in, in dry states, correct? So because when we normally do any, any we go to test uh, any structure, generally it is dry unless it has rained the previous day or, or in the morning, okay, it will be very, very wet, okay? So we need to record, okay, with, with the condition, okay, of the, concrete whether it is moist or dry okay because it's going to influence the test results okay generally okay the calibration charts are developed for dry states and uh, it's important to understand that we don't try to take only one rebound okay at a particular spot so if you just try to do any testing okay we always try to uh, take uh, uh, many locations okay we try to take readings at many important locations and at each location where we try to do the test at least we try to take more than 10 readings and take an average value of this and then try to record it as a rebound number at that particular location correct and again when you're trying to do the, take the test you are not supposed to take the readings very close to the edge okay and the distance between the readings should be at least one inch away from each other Again, test location is also equally important. In columns, we normally try to perform at the top and bottom portions. In beams, you can do it at mid span and supports because these are the places where you expect the moments to be quite high, okay, or the forces to be quite large, okay. So you can just try to always try to zero in on important locations and then try to do the test. And the the most important information that you need to be aware of this particular instrument is, okay, this. Uh, works this particular rebound okay is purely based on surface hardness correct so in the sense that okay when you just try to take a rebound okay you're doing it on the surface so the surface is very good correct obviously we get a very good number the assumption made in this particular test is okay whatever property that we have here or characteristic of the concrete we have the surface we assume that the same thing is has extended inside the, the member that's the most important assumption that we're trying to talk about so by chance if there's a big void okay behind this particular surface thin surface this particular test cannot detect 
okay that particular uh, defect okay here is what you need to understand correct okay so voids are defects present at larger depths do not influence the test results so that's a limitation of this particular test right and uh, it's important to understand that when we do the test you have to record the age of concrete like for example uh, if it's very moist new moist concrete right so the surface is relatively soft and if you're trying to take a rebound number please understand okay since it has not hardened completely right you will see that the rebound numbers are less correct and there could be some depressions also seen on the surface on the other hand if you're trying to take on very old and dry concrete surface right and please understand in such situations there is a possibility that the concrete surface is much harder than the interior surface giving rebound numbers somewhat higher than what we are supposed to get and this is because of the effect of carbonation now i'm trying to explain a very important phenomena that is carbonation which happens in concrete structures now uh, uh, i'm just trying to talk about this this is a very important uh, thing that one has to understand now as you know carbon dioxide is present in the air which is said about 0.3 percent by volume so it, this can dissolve in water correct where is the water it's on the pores okay present in the concrete at the surface and when once the carbon dioxide mix, mixes with this water and it forms a mild acidic solution please understand when you just talk about the products of hydration we have two important products okay that is the calcium silicate hydrate and the calcium hydroxide as we know calcium hydroxide is unstable not desirable okay so there is a possibility that this mild acidic solution reacts with the unstable uh, calcium hydroxide which is basically alkaline and it forms a hard insoluble calcium carbonate so this is a not desirable product okay so the reaction of mild acidic solution with alkaline calcium hydroxide gives us hard insoluble calcium carbonate so the, the surface becomes hard correct and please understand once we are trying to do a test on this hard surface correct the rebound hammer will be quite high correct and please understand that the carbonation can progress up to 20 mm okay right that's an average estimate we are talking about in very old concrete and the rebound numbers could be estimated overestimated by 50 percent and that may mislead us saying that the strength of the concrete is good please understand once the carbonation happens because you're consuming alkaline calcium hydroxide the ph value also drops down okay from an average of 12 to something like 8.5 so it, it has reduced once the alkalinity has dropped please understand okay the protection barrier of the cover concrete has reduced and this leads to an exposure of steel for corrosion and there is every likelihood that at all concrete surfaces okay where it has carbonated the reinforcement starts to corrode so you need to understand okay so uh, if you try to take rebound hammers on carbonated uh, surfaces concrete surfaces we are trying to get okay higher rebound numbers and we should not be misled saying that the uh, the, the strength of the concrete is quite good so in general okay if you have rebound numbers of more than 40 we can assume that it is very good hard layer 30 to 40 good layer 20 to 30 fair less than 20 poor and if you get zero you can easily understand okay it has already delaminated so uh, we would always try to uh, work with numbers rather than directly trying to link that with compressive strength especially in rebound numbers okay so if you're trying to have values 30 to 40 we have to be happy and then we have to take some other tests okay to just justify the quality of the concrete is consistent and good in other tests also so the next test that i'm trying to talk about here is uh, the upv or ultrasonic pulse velocity test uh, please understand that initially okay that uh, it's somewhere in 1940s okay people uh, uh, discussed that or uh, said that okay it's possible to measure velocity in concrete okay so that was what we were trying to talk about okay so of uh, pulses generated mechanically generated pulses and this clearly said that velocity primarily depends on elastic properties and not on the geometry okay of that particular member okay this was a very important interesting observation made in 1940s which led to the evolution of ultrasonic pulse velocity method 
but at that point of time okay so uh, the, the main ma major problem was how to measure this accurately okay because at that point of time okay they didn't have means and ways to measure the velocity okay appropriately so a lot of uh, research happened in france canada uk where people try to develop uh, a very good electroacoustic transducers okay which had good control on the type and frequency of the pulses generated so generally general, nowadays modern ultrasonic uh, method okay uh, instruments uses pulses okay in the frequency range of 10 to 200 kilohertz okay and uh, it's important to understand that uh, a very high frequency pulses get attenuated more quickly in concrete than lower frequency pulses this is an important observation that you have to understand and this will be carried out even in your gpr tests okay or whatever test that we are trying to talk about where we are trying to send high frequency waves so generally we don't push very high frequency waves because it gets attenuated very quickly in concrete now if you just talk about very you are trying to send very high frequency transducers okay something like 600 to 200 please understand you can uh, have information or very short distances something like about 50 mm okay you can do very accurately but however if you are trying to do very large path lengths then obviously you have to settle down for lesser frequency transducers something like 10 to 40 megabytes 40 kilohertz okay so generally uh, any a range uh, between 25 to 100 okay are found to be useful in most of the structural applications right now the one that we are trying to discuss has something like 54 uh, kilohertz is the frequency that we are trying to talk about with the instrument that we are trying to discuss correct okay? And uh, uh, in general, what you need to understand is uh, the velocity, uh, pulse velocity, uh, we are trying to send inside the concrete and hence we are trying to call it as through trans The uh, instruments that are being uh, uh, produced are quite lightweight, robust. It can be used both in uh, the laboratory as well as in the field structures. So what you are seeing here, this picture okay is a very old uh, instrument of uh, uh, upv ultrasonic pulse velocity uh, if i'm correct this we were using somewhere in uh, late 1980s okay so you have got a, a very acronym written here pundit i think most of the old timers know this okay that is portable ultrasonic non-destructive digital indicating tester so this is the instrument that we are being used and uh, here we didn't we did not have any recording devices we had to use things uh, uh, we have to record things manually and one important thing i have to uh, make you uh, notice here is a calibrating bar a standard calibrating bar which is between the two probes okay one transducer at the left and one transducer at the right so between that we have the probe or, or we have the standard calibrating bar i'll come to that a bit later now this is the modern or the recent uh, instruments that we have here okay where a single person can uh, use this particular instrument he can put it around his neck suspend it okay do some settings and then try to take the readings please understand okay the gentleman is trying to hold one transducer on his left hand one transducer on this right hand and then he's trying to uh, make the pulse travel from one end to the other end through the concrete okay so please understand if you uh, uh, try to notice the uh, readings that we have on the right hand side some important observations here correct now, when we just talk about ultrasonic pulse velocity, the important thing we are trying to talk about is we are trying to calculate the velocity of the pulse that travels through the concrete, through the concrete. So how do you calculate velocity? It is nothing but the length, path length by time taken. So it's important to just we, uh, to, to record the distance physically. So we have to measure the distance between the two transducers or between the two faces of the column in this particular case and uh, that has to be recorded and here uh, the reading says it is 0 0.220 meters or it's as good as 220 millimeters correct so that has to be physically recorded and fed into the system or into this particular apparatus and then you try to take the reading and if you just try to take the time okay so look at the time the time is something like 50.4 microsecond correct so you know micro means 10 to prof minus 6 so the instrument should be very accurate to capture a time to that value, to that value. Please understand. So as I was trying to tell you, a lot of research took place to develop such kind of transducers which are capable of trying to generate okay, pulses okay, of desired frequencies. And then that has to be measured. The time has to be measured very, very accurately. 
So the velocity in this particular case happens to be 4,370 meters per second or something like 4.37 kilometers per hour. So in one second, the, the, the pulse travels for a distance of 4.37 kilometers. It's quite fast. Okay, and it can happen if you have a very good concrete, okay, where we have minimum voids. Okay, if you got voids, a lot of voids, please understand it takes more time. If it takes more time, then understand that, okay, the velocity reduces. Correct, and the, the, the instrument also tries to give you an estimate of the compressive strength. It says something like 30.7 megapascals. But generally, we are more happy with the velocity rather than the compressive strength. Right, in this particular case. Okay, this is uh, some specification of the uh, UPV of that particular instrument. And what I would be talking about is zeroing on is the transducers. It is 54 kilohertz, okay, with, with a five feet cable, okay, is what we are trying to talk about. And please understand these can run on batteries, okay, a simple 6A batteries, six numbers can uh, make us use, we can, we can use this uh, uh, apparatus comfortably for 30 hours. And you can also try to use backlight displays, okay, in case you are trying to work in darker uh, regions. Now, uh, the important part I was trying to tell you, okay, it consists of, uh, 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 there is electric pulse generators. There is one pair, as you can clearly see. So, uh, as you can clearly in the side of the instrument, there are two leads, okay. So, one trying to go to one transducer, the other one going to the other transducer. So, one is uh, the transmitter and the other is the receiver. So please understand both are identical okay and any transducer can be used as a transmitter or it could be used as a receiver okay you can interchange okay there should be no problem with respect to that and uh, inside each transducers okay the pulses are generated by shock exciting piezoelectric crystals okay in each of the transducers and uh, uh, you can hear the frequencies okay uh, if you are trying to take the switch on the instrument and if you keep the transducer next to your ear, ears, you can hear clearly listen, okay, to these uh, 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 when the pulses that are being generated by these uh, transducers. Okay, and I was trying to tell you the calibration bar. So generally, uh, nowadays we have, we get two uh, numbers of steel bars, which can be placed between the two transducers, okay, and then we need to understand whether the uh, time, okay, uh, that we are trying to uh, get is of standard values or not. The transit times could be something like 25 microseconds in one case and 100 microseconds in the other case. And the accuracy is very important. So, okay, plus or minus 0.2 microseconds. So, within that accuracy, if you're trying to able to record these uh, values in your instrument, you need to understand, okay, the instrument is good and can be used for testing. Okay, so the measurements, uh, uh, I mean, if they do not differ by this, I think you can use these kind of instruments. And regarding the time display, so it's a four-digit liquid uh, crystal display, okay, which gives you the direct time of transmission. And uh, uh, please understand the accuracy can be something like 0.1 microseconds. So regarding the way in which you can carry out these particular tests, we have three different methodologies like opposite phases, adjacent phase, and same phase. Like uh, uh, we are going to explain that. And it's important to understand that uh, the type of uh, uh, energy that is being transmitted in each case is very different. So this is uh, a case where we are trying to have uh, the transducers being placed on opposite faces. OK, the people are working on that. OK, and uh, in this particular case, please understand, OK, assuming the left one as the transmitter and the right one as the receiver. So the launch waves, OK, you can clearly see okay get transmitted from the or the energy waves will be transmitted in all directions please understand more of longitudinal waves will be traveling and uh, the receiver will try to receive these longitudinal waves okay and these waves are more faster than any other waves that are moving sideways so it's good to record uh, or conduct a test in upv yeah, always on opposite faces as far as possible because maximum pulse energy is being transmitted in the longitudinal direction and this kind of test is generally more reliable. The path is clearly defined and we can measure it very accurately. It should be used whenever possible. Okay, the next kind of uh, uh, situation where we have to use this uh, UPV is uh, uh, in case of adjacent phases. Okay, we, it's not possible to do a, an opposite phase testing. Then we try to use it on adjacent phases, for example, a corner column. 
and we are trying to talk about what is called a semi-direct transmission. In such cases, you can clearly see that the launch will wave okay, gets dissipated just like that. It will not be collected because my transmitter is on the adjacent phase. So the uh, waves that are moving in this direction okay, gets collected. And please understand these are less faster. Okay, Obviously, less amount of energy is being uh, sent in this particular direction. Okay, And we call this as the shear or transverse waves. And it can be used satisfactorily, okay, as long as the path lengths are not too too or too long. And the distance between the transducers can be easily calculated. It cannot be measured, calculated. Maybe we can use a uh, Pythagoras theorem here, and then we can uh, uh, get the distance between the transducers. Now, coming to the last case, we have what is called as uh, uh, we are trying to do it on the same phase, like it could be on the roof. Okay, so we cannot try to take uh, one transducer and keep. opposite phase as, as far as possible we have to just see that they are perfectly aligned that is there okay now coming to the surface waves please understand here you can clearly see that the launch waves gets dissipated even the shear waves get dissipated however very, very slow waves okay do travel all i mean in the surface region and they will be collected by the receiver okay so these are the slowest and here you can clearly see uh, these group of people trying to do uh, a new PV test using uh, the surface waves, okay, uh, and uh, they're trying to test a column surface, okay, they're trying to do this on a column surface, please understand all the three sites of this particular columns, column is inaccessible, they're forced to do uh, indirect transmission, okay, for this particular column, okay, and this is the least satisfactory of all the three positions, because we receive less signals in this particular case, and please understand that uh, whatever results that we are going to get may not be the true representative of the entire concrete because okay the the quality of the concrete in the surface only influences the time of transit from the transmitter to the receiver it's as good as conducting a rebound hammer test okay in this particular case and it's important to understand once when we do these kind of tests okay the contact between the concrete and the face of the transducers should be perfect Okay, we try to say smooth contact. Please again, I'm, I'm trying to again remind you that, okay, the transducers should be kept on the concrete. It should not be kept on the mortar. We are testing a column. You have to remove the plaster. Okay, and then, okay, you have to smoothen the surface. Okay, so you can use a carborundum stone or you can use a, a grinding small uh, apparatus. You can you have to grind, smoothen the surface, and then you have to use the instrument. Correct transducers, but before we try to do do on a smooth surface, we also would like to insist on applying couplings, okay, such as petroleum jelly, grease, liquid soap, or kaolin glycerin paste, okay, on the surface of concrete, and then we try to keep the transducers on top of it. Because please understand, the time we are trying to measure is to an accuracy of plus 0 0.01 microseconds. So even a small uh, uh, void, okay, or, or space, right, is not desirable in this case. So there should be perfect smooth contact between the concrete and the face of the transducers. Regarding path length, okay, generally we try to say 150 mm least, okay, in case of uh, uh, direct transmissions or 400 in case of uh, surface uh, transmissions. Uh, if the size of aggregate is 20 mm uh, uh, less, at least 100 mm. Uh, between 20 and 40 it is minimum what we are seeing is minimum distance is what we are talking about 150 mm correct so these are minimum distances if you have uh, greater than this yeah things are fine regarding the temperature uh, generally 5 to 30 degrees is perfect okay uh, and if you are trying to have operate between 30 and 60 degrees yeah there could be some influence okay on the on the on the pulse that means the velocity can can reduce here and especially doing at uh, temperatures below the freezing point please understand the water okay, can freeze okay inside the pores okay and that can result in an increase on QPV of by 7.5 percent so all these things will be noted by the expert okay when we when he tries to do the testing and the most important part is the last one okay that I'm trying to tell you here the presence of reinforcement steel in concrete which is inevitable correct, will have a real appreciable effect on pulse velocity. So it's very desirable uh, to know that, to just try to keep your uh, transducers at places where it is relatively free or farther of the reinforcements, okay, because it's going to really affect the pulse velocities, okay. In case 
it's not possible uh, to have a place where it is quite far from the reinforcements. You need to just know where the reinforcements are, at what distance the reinforcements are, the alignment of the reinforcements are. And please understand, we have to make some kind of corrections okay, for the pulse velocity. And there are well standard established expressions, equations to do this. Okay, but uh, just to make you understand, okay, uh, we don't know where the reinforcements are in the concrete. And for you to do that, okay, we have another instrument, okay, that we normally use along with the uh, uh, UPV. We'll try to discuss that in the next uh, uh, case. Now, some standard values that we are trying to talk about as per IS 519 part 5 section 1. 2018. So this is uh, the code has been brought out very recently, some two years back. Okay, the earlier code was in 1992. Okay, now in two years back, this code has been revised. And uh, uh, as per this particular code, it says that any uh, pulse velocity that you get, uh, which is more than 4.4, the concrete grading quality is excellent, 3.75 to 4.4 kilometers per hour. The concrete quality is good anything less than uh, 3.75 that is 3 to 3.75 is doubtful in which case you have to do some further investigations on the concrete below 3 it is 4 okay so this is what ultimately we would be looking at once we do the test okay regarding the velocities and then we need to understand whether the quality is good or really we need to do more tests to uh, to just check the, the the real problem that we have in the concrete and then think of remedial measures Okay, generally we are not really looking at the strength even uh, here directly, but indirectly we can try to understand or try to can, can estimate the strength of the concrete also. Now next, uh, uh, we are trying to talk about what is called as the rebar locator. Now in this particular case, okay, so we have a uh, single uh, uh, sensor, okay, a sensor that is attached to a, a, the instrument, okay. So please understand here it's just like the steth of a doctor. Okay, the doctor uses stethoscope. So stethoscope is kept on the body of the uh, human being, and then he he tries to listen or tries to uh, uh, get some kind of uh, information. So here also we have a sensor. Okay, so using which we try to uh, uh, find out the position or location or some details about the reinforcement. Okay, is what we are trying to talk about. So we also call it as the sensor or the probe in this particular case. I'm just trying to give you a small uh, uh, demonstration, okay, uh, uh, how exactly this can be done. Now, we just try to keep this probe. Now, what you are trying to see this blue one, okay, this this big one, big one is nothing but a concrete uh, uh, slab. And these black dots, let's assume that they are the reinforcements, okay, which are running perpendicular to the screen, correct? We just try to take this probe sensor and arbitrarily keep it on the surface. Okay, so please understand once you keep it on the surface, okay, and switch on the instrument, please understand we get a reading which just gets displayed, okay, on the screen, okay, and say assume that something like 30 millimeters. Now, please understand this uh, uh, instrument works on a magnetic principle. So that means, okay, it just tries to sense, okay, this reinforcement and then estimates the distance, okay, and then that is displayed here. Correct. Now we will not be knowing where exactly we are. Okay. Once you place the probe on the concrete surface, reinforced concrete surface. So we normally try to move this particular uh, sensor, right? Okay. That is in two directions in any particular concrete structure, say X direction and Y direction, because you know that the reinforcements are present in X direction and in Y direction, perpendicular directions. So right now I'm trying to move it to the right. So as I start moving to the right, you'll notice that, okay, the distance okay will start to reduce okay between the probe and the reinforcement so once you start to move this gradually okay from position one to position two okay you'll be noticing that the numbers okay here will start to reduce say it could be 30 29 28 uh, 27 like that okay and once you're below the reinforcement please understand the distance is the least as you can understand right but i'm not sure what the distance is i will not be knowing anything so let me suppose that the distance, least distance is 15 millimeters. So get a number 15. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I start continuing to move this probe to the right. So please understand once I start moving to the right, what will happen to this distance? 15 mm will start to increase. So from 15, it becomes 16. Please understand initially the reading was reducing. Okay, it reached a max, a max minimum value. 
okay right and then it starts to increase so the moment the reading starts to increase please understand you hear a beep sound from the instrument and all you're supposed to do is okay come back or stop there at, at, at the stop uh, at, I mean, exactly at the point where you hear the beep and then you need to understand that okay you're right below the reinforcement you can just try to take a, a, a marker just try to put a mark okay beside this particular instrument saying that this is where the reinforcement is okay now once you start continuing to move to the right you have heard the beep the reading starts to increase you got a value of 30 okay somewhere there and then once you start moving to the right it, it, it senses the other reinforcement assume that we are right at the mid okay of the two bars 30 mm and again once you start moving to the right so again the reading from 30 starts to reduce okay again you get 15 and again the moment you start to move to the right okay again you get a beep sound correct it's a very simple way of trying to do the test okay so we can try to do it in x direction and y direction on the surface of the concrete and then we can map the position of the reinforcement it's important to understand that whatever readings you're trying to record here gives you the distance between the reinforcement and the and the uh, sensor so when you hear the beep okay whatever reading you get displayed okay is nothing but the clear cover to the reinforcement you can take it as the clear cover okay to the reinforcement and please understand that okay also you get an a bar diameter okay so that means an approximate bar diameter also gets displayed okay in the screen correct so we have two things over there okay one is the clear cover and also the approximate bar diameter okay gets displayed in the screen so this is a gentleman trying to uh, use this particular uh, uh, i mean uh, instrument okay to just uh, know the or to locate the uh, position of the reinforcement okay on the uh, uh, concrete surface you can clearly map it and you can clearly see that a single person okay can easily use this particular instrument okay without any difficulty right so generally we uh, the, the instrument can have two different types of probes but you can attach only one probe at a time either shallow probe or you can attach deep probe correct so shallow probe uh, for less uh, sensitive uh, uh, it works for only for small distances deep probe for relatively large distances correct and this can give you the size orientation of the bar and also the clear cover okay and this is especially important when we are trying to do tests of upv that is ultrasonic pulse velocity the previous test and the concrete coat cutter so i'm trying to tell you for shallow probes are good up to 100 mm deep probes are good up to 185 mm okay right now let me go to the next instrument that we have here this is called the corrosion analysis instrument okay this instrument uh, is also uh, on the body you can clearly see this as canon or c stands for corrosion an stands for analysis in stands for instrument and you can have different types of uh, uh, probes here what we are trying to see is rod electrode you can also have wheel ele wheel electrodes also so this instrument is supplied with rod electrode now regarding corrosion as you know is not a very good thing in uh, reinforced concrete structure because the reinforcement uh, will uh, really uh, get affected and then the strength of the structure will become uh, 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 very weak correct it's not advisable right so this uh, particular instrument can really highlight okay the activity of uh, corrosion before it becomes visible so early detection is the key factor in preventing an unanticipated structural failure now this basically works on a principle of half cell corrosion potential method okay i'll not get into the complexity of this particular thing so we have two half cells here the first half cell is the electrode okay over here which you're trying to see right where a copper uh, uh, i mean uh, rod is being dipped in a copper sulfate solution and this is kept okay on the concrete surface now this electrode is attached okay to this old meter that is the instrument and from the instrument again a lead okay goes and then connects get itself connected to a reinforcement okay anywhere in the, in the concrete surface so that means this particular test primarily uh, necessitates you to open the reinforcement at some particular location and then anywhere in the slab okay or in that particular structure 
and the instrument should be uh, uh, attached. So we have two half cells basically. The first half cell is this particular electro itself and the second half cell is nothing but this reinforcement surrounded by the concrete. So we've got two half cells here. So we are trying to measure the potential difference between the two and then at various locations, at various locations. And then we can estimate the possibility of the corrosion, the extent of corrosion in the structure is what you're trying to talk about. Okay, first, first half cell and the second half cell that circled uh, uh, in informations. So as I told you, the, half, the first half cell consists of a reference electrode like a copper rod immersed in copper sulfate solution right the second one okay is the reference electrode which is connected okay with the reinforcement through an voltmeter okay and then you just try to go on placing the electrodes at different positions and then you just try to calculate the potential difference between the two half cells now just try to make you understand in a very simple way the first thing that you need to understand here is you just try to take uh, uh, assume that we are trying to do this particular test on some concrete surface it could be vertical or horizontal if I horizontal, it could be above or below, whatever it is, correct? So we normally can divide this into many uh, grids, okay, right? So I'm just trying to have eight columns and four rows. I have just tried to meticulously name it as A, B, C, D, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we understand there are 32 grids that I have tried to divide this particular slab into. So anyway, it's in your convenience. You can try to divide into as many rows and columns. An approximate uh, one meter, one meter grid should be sufficient is what we normally presume. OK, so the next important thing is in your instrument, you have to really uh, give this amount of information as to how many uh, grids uh, what is the, what is the uh, information regarding grids as to number of rows and columns. You should also mention as to how you are trying to take the readings as are you trying to take the readings row wise or column wise because everything is stored. OK, and then that information is used to plot contours is what is important, correct? Right? So please understand, we'll be trying to take readings at the center of these grids in a systematic way. It could be row by row or column by column. So that means these 32 readings, okay, where we have put the X marks, okay, get recorded, okay, and then we try to take this and then we try to plot contours. So here you're trying to see a gentleman trying to uh, take readings on a concrete uh, uh, surface, right, where this has been divided number of grids and is trying to do it uh, uh, alone, okay? And this is uh, a contour that we can understand, correct? Where we have tried to really uh, uh, show you different colored pattern, uh, patterns, okay? Which indicates uh, uh, equipotential lines is what we are trying to talk about. And you can clearly see the range, okay? In this particular scale, it says uh, minus 600 millivolts to uh, 300 millivolts, correct? That's the range that, we, that that is we're trying to talk about. So the important thing is, okay, if the values are uh, less, uh, okay, it's very less, then we have chances of uh, uh, corrosion happening here, okay? That we can, I just try to give the table, you'll really understand with respect to that, okay? So regarding the instrument, okay, it's quite light in weight, as you saw, we have uh, six batteries op operated, you have the displays, Okay, any normal person can 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 do that. So the important thing is uh, what you need to understand is if the values are less than minus 500 millivolts, uh, I mean, you don't need to use this instrument. Okay, it, it's already visible. Okay, minus 350 to minus 500 millivolts in that range, in that band, 94% chance of corrosion happening. Minus 200 to minus 350, something like a 50% chance of corrosion uh, in that particular region. More than minus 200 millivolts. Okay, so only 5% chances. So what you need to understand is you can just try to do this, okay, on any surface, especially important structures, and then try to understand, okay, whether uh, the, the reinforcement is on the threshold of corrosion or already has started to corrode, and then you can try to do some kind of remedial measures. Okay, uh, anyway, to satisfy the testing needs, I was trying to tell you there are different types of electrodes available, rod electrode, wheel electrode, and vendor probe. So this gentleman is trying to use this instrument using single rod electrode, and it is advisable to use this instrument uh, for less surface areas, something like less than 200 square feet or less than 200 meter square areas. If the area becomes large, say up to up to 1000 uh, uh, square feet or 100 meter square, so we can think of using one wheel electrode. If the area becomes more, then we can think of using uh, four wheel electrodes. Anyway, these are means to take readings, okay, uh, over here. But anyway, the principle remains same. 
Okay, so we can use uh, EEIM, download these information and then try to plot the test areas directly. All those advantages are there. So let me go to the uh, next uh, I mean, instrument that we have here. It is called the resistivity meter. Now, please understand the difference between this instrument and the previous instrument. Okay, you need to understand very clearly. The previous instrument is a corrosion analysis instrument. It really tells you what is the extent of corrosion that has happened inside uh, in the in reinforcement bars which are inside the concrete. Now, this tries to tell you this resistivity meter will tell you the ability of the cover concrete to resist corrosion. Ability of the cover concrete to resist corrosion. How good is the cover concrete? Okay, to resist corrosion is what we are trying to talk about. Okay, right. So here we are trying to just check. Okay, the specific electrical resistivity of the concrete. Now this particular electrical resistivity will give you good information about the state of concrete. Okay, of the cover concrete that we have here. So once we try to understand the state of concrete, we can try to link that to corrosion rate. Because if the state of concrete is bad, cover concrete, then chances of corrosion is more. Great. So we just try to give you direct relation between the resistivity and the chloride diffusion rate. So what you are trying to see on this picture, there is on the right hand side, okay, the resistivity meter being held by a person, okay, on the concrete. Okay. So there are four contact points that you can clearly see on the left hand side. You can clearly see these four props. Okay, they are equally spaced, correct? And you can understand that. Okay, they are all electrically collect, connected in the sense that the two outer probes or electrodes are connected to an ammeter, and the two inner electrodes are connected to an voltmeter. So please understand, we are more interested to get a reading directly on the surface, and it's important to understand that the tip of the electrodes. Okay, whatever this contact surfaces generally will be uh, made moist. We can also fit, uh, uh, I mean, uh, moist foam, okay, caps, okay, and then try to do that. So that will be more effective when we try to do the test. Correct. So what we call as superconductive foams, okay, can be uh, plugged into these uh, electrodes, okay, and so that there will be perfect uh, contact between them. So we are we are trying to get the reading directly on that LCD display, which indicates the. Uh, directly the uh, resistivity of the concrete and important to understand that uh, okay the, the readings here okay are very important to us correct if the reading is more than 12 kilowatt centimeter please understand corrosion is improbable okay it will not happen at all okay right if it is between 8 and 12 okay it's likely to corrode and if it is less than 8 it is fairly sure to occur now please understand this can be directly linked to carbonation also Okay, if the cover concrete has carbonated, I told you, okay, the alkalinity has reduced. That means there is the, the resistance has reduced. So we will definitely also un understand indirectly that carbonation has happened or there is some very serious problem with respect to that cover concrete. And we can just try to replace that particular concrete with a good concrete or cover concrete so that you're trying to give a good fresh uh, protection barrier. That means the life of reinforcement can be increased enormously okay and this has to be done in all important structures especially marine structures this can be attempted now the next one we are trying to talk about is the impact echo test it's a very simple thing that you can understand echo is nothing but hearing uh, uh, the sound that has been created okay back correct so that's what we uh, 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 mean by echo okay whatever sound wave is generated if we hear this it again we call it as echo now here are talking about impact. Impact is nothing but you are trying to produce the uh, I mean, uh, energy or sound wave by giving an impact okay, on the surface. So please understand, okay, this is generally done to know the defects in structures where the other side is inaccessible. Okay, so please understand this is not done in generally done in case of structures where both surfaces are accessible. Like for example, if that is the case, then we can do an UPV test and then we be very happy okay, with the results. So this is in case of situations where, okay, it's unilaterally accessible concrete members. You can do it up to 800 uh, millimeter depth. So if you just try to look at this instrument, so please understand, okay. So there are many things that we are trying to talk about here. I'm not sure, like there are many steel balls, okay, that are uh, uh, here along with the instrument, many steel balls, okay. And these steel balls have a small slender uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, stick, okay, which is used to strike 
the uh, surface of the concrete. So small uh, hammers, small hammers, correct? Small hammers will try to give less uh, impact, whereas big uh, balls will try to give you more impact, uh, higher sound waves is what you need to understand. If you want to create a higher impact, okay, we use bigger uh, 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 balls, okay, steel balls. And if you want to give a small impact, small uh, values, we try to give a small uh, impact value is what we're trying to talk about. And this one is nothing but a, a sensor, okay, right, which tries to hear and, and pick up the echo, okay, which can be amplified and then that can be processed and, and in a computer and we can just try to tell where exactly the defects are. So you can try to use different uh, steel balls, okay, with greater intensity starting from the least diameter ball, go on striking. Okay, so that you are trying to test the uh, concrete surfaces to various depths because there has to penetrate and then, okay, that, that's rebound. So you can just try, try, okay, depending upon the depth of the member, you can try different steel balls. You can also try to uh, uh, do this at uh, intervals of 100 mm. You can go on striking the same ball at different depths as it all right, so that you can cover a bigger area, okay, during the test. That can be done. So this is the steel ball we are trying to talk about. So the frequencies generated could be re ranging from 10 to 150 kilohertz. It depends on the diameter of the ball you are trying to use here. Correct. So please understand the proper the, the, the uh, image of the elastic wave, right? That is amplitude time system propagating the element. Okay, being tested is recorded using the computer, and this image is then transformed, and the amplitude frequency spectrum can be generated by an FFT or an ANN uh, uh, kind of analysis. Okay, and then we can try to do a detailed analysis with respect to the kind of signals we are trying to get. So a very uh, a descriptive way of trying to make you understand, for example, this picture, okay, we are trying to give a small impact using those steel balls, okay, the, the energy goes down, okay, and please understand uh, if there is an imperfection, the signal gets rebounded, okay, which is picked up by that sensor, okay, and then you can do all kind of analysis. So it's important to note that Okay, the transducer should not be kept very close to the uh, place where we're trying to create the impact. Correct. So that's one important thing that we are trying to talk about. So again, these are again some uh, pictures where we are trying to tell you that uh, we can have uh, uh, graphs of uh, amplitude versus time and amplitude versus frequency and such kind of uh, interpretations will try to give you the location of uh, uh, points or, or places inside the concrete where the defects exist. Okay, and it, this is generally can be used with very high accuracy, okay, to, defect, to detect the uh, uh, flaws, okay, and uh, sometimes if the defects are filled with water, it becomes very uh, 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 problematic to uh, identify that. Uh, you, you can use this to detect thickness, honeycomb, voids, etc. in concrete and any masonry structures. So it's a very simple process where you're trying to take the instrument, you're trying to hit it on the surface, these two kind of steel balls, and then try to hear echoes which is picked up by the sensors, it's processed, and then you can try to uh, do some kind of an analysis and then try to understand where the defects are inside the concrete structure. Now, another important test or which is very, very popular that we are trying to talk about is the surface penetration radar test. Okay, generally people also call this the GPR, ground penetration radar test, GPR. Okay, because we are trying to talk about concrete, we can also call it as the surface penetration radar test. So radar here indicates it's nothing but radio detection and ranging uh, kind of uh, a test that we are trying to talk about. So the uh, apparatus should be quite sophisticated as you can understand. Okay, we have to send signals, okay, into the uh, radar rays or signals or pulses into the surface. And then, okay, uh, and as we have said in the previous uh, discussion, echo, that means the, the, uh, the, the signals will get reflected only if there is a change in the material inside that particular surface. Okay, and that has to be captured and hence we have to have a receiver. So we have a transmitter and the receiver in this particular case, a battery, okay, control unit and computer to process all those requirements. Correct. So important, okay, uses radar pulses to image the subsurface. I'm going to show you some pictures where the subsurface of the, the objects present inside this concrete surface can be imaged. So we generally use high frequency polarized radio waves, okay, which are transmitted to the surface. So uh, generally we need to understand that if you're using very high frequency, you can try to penetrate only to lower distances. But if you want to penetrate higher distances, then we can use low uh, frequency polarized radio waves. Correct. So when the waves hits a buried object, 
or a boundary with a different dielectric constant. Like for example, you've got concrete. So inside concrete, we have a reinforcement. So obviously the property of the two are different. Okay, they have got different elastic constants, correct? So uh, initially the, the, uh, the pulse will be traveling to, through the concrete. Okay, and once it hits the uh, reinforcement, it gets reflected. Whereas the uh, uh, pulse which is adjacent to that does not get reflected. So you can clearly get a map Okay, where you have got uh, uh, I mean places or or, or, or or points where reflections have occurred and uh, even the uh, uh, reflections, okay, the, the, the kind of images that we are trying to get will be different for different depths and different materials. And here we need to understand that we have to have a good kind of uh, image processing knowledge to know what kind of materials exist. Like for example, you're studying uh, uh, GIS, you know how to, uh, how exactly it's important to read the images, correct? So in a similar sense, we need to map, uh, we have, once we get the images here, okay, from this particular test, we have to uh, uh, understand how to interpret these kind of images. For example, look at this, a person is trying to move from right to left using this uh, surface penetration radar. Okay, this could be on a ground or it could be a concrete surface. Correct. So here you can clearly see these red arcs. What you are trying to see are nothing but the radio, uh, I mean, sorry, radar waves. Okay, that are being uh, uh, penetrated or uh, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, uh, transmitted. Okay, from the instrument into the surface. So they are just trying to go travel in one direction. So once it is uh, sent on a uh, on a point where you have got some buried object, look at this. Okay, the re the, the signal gets rebounded. So what you are trying to see is. The red one are the signals that are being going downward and the blue ones are the one that is trying to go up, okay, which gets reflected. So all these things will be captured. So whereas the ray, the, 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 the signal that was sent just to this, okay, does not get reflected. So you need to understand, okay, with this kind of information. So please understand it's possible to have some kind of uh, image mapping. Like for example, you can have, a, 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 you can just try to use this instrument and then scan the surface and then get this kind of an image. But it's important to understand that Okay, we have to have good amount of knowledge to interpret this kind of uh, images. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, you'll be surprised that uh, there is there are MTech courses, okay, which offer only on GPR, okay, that is ground uh, penetration radar kind of uh, uh, techniques. Okay, so that is the kind of advancement that has happened in these kind of uh, uh, field, right? So basically, you can see through anything. It could be solid pavement materials, anything asked for concrete to detect subsurface objects and determine the condition and thickness of the material examined. Please understand this is very, very important because nowadays if you just try to go into any uh, metro, correct, or any uh, developing city. So you just try to see many high rise structures, okay, which are going up. But please understand, or you need to understand that there would be also a lot of buried things inside. Correct. There could be a lot of telecommunication lines, power supply lines. Okay, it, there could be sewer lines. Okay, that are there, and uh, sometimes, okay, uh, good documentation will not be made with respect to that. So, in such situations, okay, so these kind of tools will try to help you to understand what is there below the surface. It could be concrete surface, or it could be your ground or pavement, whatever it is, so that okay, you don't get into problems. There will be no accidents. Okay, or not, you're not trying to uh, I mean, uh, uh, get come in contact with a live wire, embedded wire. You, are, you can understand the kind of serious situations that can happen. Okay, so or the delays that can happen. So all these things can be easily avoided if you're trying to use such kind of techniques. Correct. Okay? So you can use just to collect information on subsurface elements like roads, bridges, sports grounds, golf courses, symmetries in RC structures. It can accurately locate metallic and non-metallic reinforcements, pipes below the concrete slabs. It can also detect flaws in concrete structures. Look at this, correct? A person is trying to just scan, okay, a concrete wall, okay, using uh, this uh, tool, correct? Is it all right? Okay, surface penetration radar tool, correct? So please look at this, okay? You can get a scanned image, okay, right? Okay, and please understand this is any day better than your uh, cover meter test or your profometer that we normally use. But understand, obviously, this is very sophisticated. It's very expensive also, correct? So, and, and you can, it's not necessary that uh, you have to take this, okay, uh, uh, to a system and then read it. Nowadays, 
okay as i told you the technology is so advanced you can have an ipad okay you can have an ipad connected with this and then uh, a single person okay can just try to keep an ipad just like that and then scan and then exactly know okay what exactly is there what is there below in, inside the concrete so uh, what we are trying to talk about is uh, uh, nowadays uh, the the technology is progressing to such an extent that okay you can get very good in, in detailed information about the concrete the only thing is yeah as i told you they are very expensive and it has to be done only at those places where it necessitates us to do these kind of tests but however they they are available okay where you can map deteriorated zones in reinforced concrete okay consistent with corrosive environment and related damage like spalling delamination you can get the rebars okay or your uh, tension cables in case of pre stressed concrete thickness of the slab you can locate non metallic and metallic conduits like it could be your electric uh, conduits or whatever it is correct uh, uh, fiber networks heating elements plumbing elements detect voids variation in concrete mixes can also be rectified for example getting a uniform colored pattern in one 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 band and suddenly you get a different uh, image colored image so we can clearly understand that there is some difference in the concrete mix itself so these are things that we can be done and uh, when we just talk about the pavements yeah uh, please understand that the same tool can be mounted on uh, the vehicles and you can just try to drive it uh, in your regular speed and then you can just try to uh, get information okay about the bridge deck okay or it could be the uh, uh, pavements what not okay all these things can be easily done using uh, this kind of uh, tool that is surface penetration radar test now yeah now we have an interesting test like x ray computed tomography so tomography is an image okay of an object by sections or sectioning or slices through the use of uh, any kind of penetrating waves okay now uh, if you just try to look at this uh, 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 we, we we try to go to a doctor and then we try to uh, get examined and then uh, uh, we go for a ct scan so what we are trying to do is we are trying to do a similar kind of a ct scan here and i have got a very interesting uh, uh animation okay going uh, ahead here so we have a simple uh, uh, concrete cylinder here where you are trying to move the slice in x direction and y direction and you are trying to see that uh, uh, you can clearly see the voids the uh, inclusions that we have like the matrix okay a and the uh, and the cement matrix and cement paste itself so these are slices taken in x and y direction this is a slice taken in the z direction so that's the the perpendicular direction so you can clearly see this kind of things it's very very interesting and it's also possible for you to uh, have some kind of color coding you can separate the voids you can separate the uh, uh, inclusions we have the matrix so all the three things can be separated out okay you can just try to rotate those kind of things and then try to understand the different kind of uh, uh, voids or pores that we have here so we can still do a very uh, i mean refined uh, uh, pore analysis like for example these are the only pores okay that are present okay inside that particular uh, concrete so i can just try to even separate these pores into different sizes like for example small pores medium pores and big pores with different colors like light blue uh, one like this one less than 0.02 mm uh, yellow colored uh, i mean uh, pores okay the one that you are trying to see now ranging from 0.2 to 0.3 mm dark blue colored uh, uh, pores ranging from 0.3 to 0.4 mm and the green sized uh, uh, pores okay that we are trying to have here somewhere between 0.4 to 0.5 mm and more than 0.5 mm okay red pore so you can also do these kind of classifications okay uh, comfortably and then know the anomalies so so that means what i'm trying to say is you can try to take these pores that you try to normally take out from your uh concrete surface okay and then uh, we can try to uh, we can try to use this okay for uh, any kind of testing can know the kind of defects in the concrete correct right? now let me just try to take you through uh, the core cutter so please understand uh, this is a very standard test that we normally do in case of a core cutter where we try to use different kind of tools to uh, uh, take cores the cores are normally cylindrical specimens the diameter varies from 100 to 150 mm the standard size is 100 mm generally we use in the uh, field okay and uh, we can also try to uh, see that the diameter is uh, at least more, three times more than the nominal maximum size of the aggregate and the total length of the core that we normally try to extract will depend on the engineering charge okay, that we are trying to have here 
uh, and generally we try to al also uh, see that the length of the core sample is related to the core diameter okay uh, if you just try to take any uh, standard testing we have the length diameter ratio being 2 so we can have a when you try to do an extraction you can have something like 2.5 uh, 2.2 or 2.3 then you can trim and then try to have these values of l by d ratio then that 2 and then take it sometimes you it's it may not be possible to have l by d ratio 2 it could be less than 2 in which case uh, we try to do a very simple uh, correction factor using these kind of uh, graphs like for example i have a, uh, a 1.4 as the uh, length to uh, height to diameter ratio so i can just try to use this particular table okay get some uh, correction factor here this I can multiply on the uh, value that I get from the uh, compressive strength on that particular uh, uh, core, core that I have tested. So this can be done, okay? And uh, whatever cylinder value uh, I get, I can multiply by 1.25 to get an approximated equivalent cube strength. But one important thing I would like to tell you here is, okay, the core that you take out, okay, uh, generally will be in a dry state. It's advisable that you try to uh, put it in water, make it moist, and then do the test before testing. So these are different kinds of uh, uh, mortars or whatever it is available to help you do the test. Now the next part is the cut and pull out test, okay, where we try to uh, make a small cut inside the concrete, okay, put an insert, okay, inside that and then pull the insert out till the uh, concrete fails locally and it's important to understand that the strength of the concrete is uh, uh, determined based on the effort required to pull the concrete. So the more effort you take, okay, more okay is the uh, uh, i mean uh, strength of the concrete is what we are trying to talk about so i'm just trying to give you a small uh, 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 picture here okay which shows you how this test is being done okay so it's a very uh, simple uh, test that is being uh, performed here so a small insert is initially uh, fixed uh, inside the uh, uh, concrete surface as you can clearly see here so a small insert is being uh, uh, fixed and then we try to keep this instrument Okay, and then we try to pull this uh, instrument. I'm sorry, okay, there's some problem. I'll really skip that. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to use this. This is a very interesting uh, video. It gives you a lot of uh, insight. I think it's loading. I think uh, uh, one minute. Yeah, I think so. You can see that person is trying to put an insert over there, and then we try to uh, put a, a bolt over there, okay, to fix that. Then we try to keep the instrument, okay. So we keep the instrument, right? Now, let me just try to take you a bit forward. Okay, it's been. I, I think if I can take this. Okay, we are trying to take that instrument. We are trying to fix it over there. And there is a dial over there which you can see on the left side. So we just try to go on turning the instrument like that. Okay, sorry, something happened over there. So once you just try to tighten that, okay, you will see some kind of uh, 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 failure over there and then uh, we try to estimate this print. Now let me go to the next one, a Windsor probe test. Now uh, this particular test is quite simple. It's uh, uh, we are trying to take a uh, apparatus similar to a gun. We try to keep it on the surface and then we try to fire the uh, uh, bullet over there, a metal bullet. And we if we get more damage, it, it, it represents that there is more uh, uh, the strength of the concrete is less. It's a very simple test that is being done. OK, so only thing is we have to be careful when you're trying to do the test properly. So this is called the Windsor probe test. You keep the uh, gun in contact with the surface and then fire it appropriately. Next, we try to do load test on structures. Uh, uh, sometimes it is possible that uh, we have to estimate the uh, strength of the concrete, okay, uh, uh, or, or the structure, strength of the concrete structure. 
So we have no uh, idea about what is the load carrying capacity, in which case we try to do a, a full load test in the sense that we try to subject it to a, a load which is more than its capacity. For example, anyway, full dead load is al already there. Now, if the structure is supposed to take an impact imposed load of four mega uh, four uh, newton per uh, uh, four megapascals, right? Sorry, okay. So we are trying to talk about uh, uh, I mean four km per meter square. I'm sorry, four km per meter square. So we just try to load uh, by one point two five times higher. It could be something like five uh, uh, km per meter square. And then we try to subject it to uh, increase this load gradually over a period of 24 hours because we don't want to take any risk okay, of uh, trying to damage the structure. And if there is, uh, we try to normally try to monitor the deflections uh, periodically, correct, or continuously. And if the deflections exceed permissible values, or we try to uh, stop the test. Okay, If the deflections do not exceed the permissible values, we try to load it to the full extent. Then we try to wait uh, for 24 hours and then remove the load, we talk about the recovery, and then we try to say that we can certify the uh, structure is fit for to carry the load. So these are some of the uh, things that are normally used to uh, do the testing. So this is a picture where uh, a standard truck is uh, load truck is there to uh, test a new bridge. So this is again uh, trucks which are loaded and then uh, tested to, to satisfy the IRC requirements. So these are some pictures, these are some uh, instruments that are used to do the test. Now I'm just uh, done with the uh, uh, last uh, two or three tests, very simple test. I was talking about the carbonation test. Now just talk about the carbonation test. I, I told you it's not good. How do we just know whether the uh, carbonation has happened or not? All you're supposed to do is, okay, uh, uh, break open uh, the concrete surface uh, slightly in the sense, say about five millimeters. Okay, expose the concrete at a depth of five millimeter. Take a, a solution of freshly, uh, mixed uh, uh, phenolphthalein in ethanol 0.2% solution and then spray on the on the concrete surface if the surface turns pink then we need to understand carbonation has happened not happened okay however it turns colorless then we need to understand carbonation has happened so what we do we try to break open another 5 millimeters and then redo the test again spray the same 0.2% solution of phenolphthalein in ethanol if it turns pink then we need to understand that the carbonation has progressed up to that up to that depth. So, uh, having uh, I mean identified the depth of carbonation, you can just try to remove that amount of concrete, and then you can try to uh, apply a fresh, uh, good uh, layer of uh, cover concrete, and then see that you protect the con uh, concrete surface so that uh, you can try to uh, rectify that problem. So, regarding the chlorides or uh, sulfates or the pH whatever we are trying to test, we are trying to talk about. Please understand, these again can be done using some simple chemical analysis where we can just try to take uh, the uh, concrete samples at different depths, like it could be 5 mm depth, 10 mm depth or 15 mm depth, take it to the laboratory, we can grind it to a very fine powdery form and then we can do these kind of analysis just to determine the percentage of sulfate content, okay, or it could be the pH value okay or chloride contents we can we can just try to determine and then understand whether the uh, uh, values are within the permissible limit or not okay if it is within the permissible limit things are fine otherwise we have to remove that concrete and then uh, make good uh, the fresh uh, we have to just try to have a good uh, cover concrete now coming to the uh, concluding remarks uh, about this particular uh, topic the availability of wide range of ndt devices has made it easier to monitor quality or distress or durability of the concrete structures these devices have proved to be reliable and invaluable. Uh, depending upon the requirement, two or more tests are to be conducted to get the required information regarding the quality and strength of concrete. And the last and most important thing, interpretation of test results requires competent persons to arrive at acceptable evaluation of concrete regarding its quality and strength. So uh, it's not that we can just try to take this and then uh, try to uh, get some reading and then try to arrive at the values. So finally, repair, restoration, rehabilitation involves very high cost and consumes plenty of time. So the best way to avoid NDT is to ensure quality at the, at the time of construction. Okay. So I would like to express my sincere thanks and indebtedness to all sources from which the information is assimilated in this presentation which is used basically to disseminate knowledge among students and professionals. I would like to thank all my teachers and colleagues in the department 
who are who have supported me in this particular uh, area of non-destructive testing. I would like to thank my institution, Sri Jajam Rajar College of Engineering, JSSTU, for having provided all these kind of instruments, most of these instruments, okay, in our campus, okay, to uh, carry out these uh, kind of tests. Okay, anyway, uh, this uh, exercise was just to give you some basic information about the different tests that are available in NDT. That is some of the important tests, but please understand this is uh, not all the tests and uh, probably uh, if you just try to open out uh, the current status, okay, we have a lot of uh, new uh, instruments that are being, uh, uh, I mean, uh, supplied uh, that are that are coming to the market like uh, artificial intelligence or augmented reality kind of uh, GPRs are available are, are made available to the market which which is really very uh, good with respect to the data uh, 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 in giving information but at the same time they are very very expensive so with this I would like to say a big thank you to the organizers okay for giving me an opportunity to share some information in NDT and if there are any questions okay I would be very happy to uh, uh, take those questions here right now. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for that amazing and very nice presentation. And you have covered all the suitable methodology, various instrument operating procedure in the most simplest way with respect to uh, non-destructive and semi-destructive tests, which are commonly used to get strength of concrete and different structural elements uh, of a building. So thank you so much, sir, once again. Thank so you. Now there is some queries uh, raised with the participants. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sir, first question goes like this. This question asked by Ms. Deepa. Instead of carbon stone, which material we can use to rub the concrete surface? Yeah, I, I told you, you can use also a grinder. A grinding machine can also be used. Okay, if you don't have a carbon stone, it's supplied along with the uh, rebound hammer. It's generally supplied. Okay, but again, it gets uh, it also gets worn and torn you can get a new carborundum stone okay by the supplier or you can use a small grinding machine is it all right and you can smooth on the surface and then only you can do any test like it could be rebound hammer or it could be ultrasonic pulse velocity test thank you sir next question from lokesh the question goes like this a rebound hammer will give characteristic strength or target mean strength right okay so what we are talking about is the actual strength okay in the structure Right. So please understand you are talking about uh, uh, whatever uh, I mean, when we say target strength or they, they are nothing but before you start doing the uh, I mean, uh, um, like uh, you're doing a mixed design, you want to achieve some particular value of strength. Correct. So, for example, 30 grade, you cannot straight away mix a concrete with 30 grade and then expect in field to get 30 grade concrete. So we always try to target it a higher value. That is a target strength. So what we are talking about is the in-situ strength the actual strength in the structure, correct? So please understand this, uh, this uh, characteristic strength and target strength is for your calculations. So you're doing a mixed design, right? So you want the member to have this amount of uh, grade of concrete, correct? So that is the characteristic strength. So to achieve that, you're trying to have what is called as target mean strength, where we are trying to have two things. One is statistical uh, control, that is T, that is based on 95% uh, uh, passing criteria. And the other one is the kind of standard uh, quality control that we have to the site. So based on that, that T and S gets fixed and you're trying to have a value something like 36 or 37 mega, uh, megapascals is what you're targeting at, okay, to get a value of 30 at site, correct? So uh, because there could be many situations that can happen and then the strength can reduce. Because of that, you have a target mean strength. But here what we're talking about is the actual strength in the structure. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, now next question from Krishnan Srinivasan. Oh, for underwater concreting, which type of uh, rebound hammers we can use to get the strength? Okay, so when you just talk about underwater concreting, underwater concreting, I mean uh, structure, you mean you're talking about concrete structure? Yes, sir. You're talking about uh, underwater concrete structure? Yes, sir. Okay. So I, I, I don't think uh, we can try to do that properly because there could be many situations where uh, uh, things uh, can disturb, but still you can try because uh, I'm not sure whether my instrument is capable of trying to uh, do that in the presence of water because the water can easily enter the rebound hammer. Okay, and that may re really uh, try to uh, influence the rebound hammers. Not only I, don't, I have not come across uh, instances where rebound hammer has been done in on, I mean, inside the water, but definitely you can use some other tools or techniques to evaluate 
uh, the, this, the, the strength of the uh, structure. Maybe you can do or take a small core. If it's really required, we try to do a core. Please understand uh, when you want to do a core core uh, sample or do kind of a semi destructive test, it has to associate. That means there should be enough evidence for us to uh, I mean, uh, damage and then get the uh, actual correct values. However, if, if not, we, we are more than happy to do uh, NDT test uh, uh, only. Okay, I don't know what is the situation or uh, which necessitates us to really go underwater and do an airborne hammer. I'm not sure, but given a situation, we can try to work on uh, other means and ways to get or estimate the quality of the concrete uh, uh, which is present inside the water. Thank you, sir. Next question from Arjun and Anjan from VC. Can we use a type in the rebound hammer to check the compressive strength of masonry wall? No, no, we have a different, uh, in fact, uh, uh, remote hammer available for masonry structures. Okay, so N is not recommended, but still you can use it in case you feel that, uh, I, I mean, uh, you have that uh, acceptability criteria, you've done it, but generally for masonry, we have a different uh, uh, remote hammer for that purpose. Thank you, sir. One more question from Dr. Rajivan. Can we use a uh, amber rebound hammer test for old structures? Yeah, I told you, no, like we use for both old and new structures. But if you are trying to use very old structures, we have to be a bit careful in the sense carbonation may have happened. So in which case we have to also understand to what depth the carbonation has progressed and uh, if is it really affecting the result. OK, because carbonation will definitely uh, try to harden the surface because of formation of uh, uh, that product, okay, Cal calcium hydroxide reacts with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, carbon dioxide, right? So you get a, a very hard surface over there. So uh, that does and, and reduce the alkalinity. So it does not really uh, justify. So in the sense, if you also establish the level of carbonation, then we can try to take a good decision with respect to the value of the rebound hammer. Thank you so much sir, for sharing the information and clarifies the queries raised by the participants. This for the questions for you today. Uh, oh, once again, you. I mentioned that it was a very informative session and your presentation was very interesting. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You. Now, our request, Professor Kanmani says, to propose a vote of thanks. What do you mean? Thank you, Professor Rajit. Good afternoon, one and all present. As we have come to the end of today's webinar on non destructive testing of concrete structures by Dr. S. Raviraj, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion. On behalf of our department, I acknowledge and convey my heartfelt thanks to the resource person, today's speaker, Dr. S. Ravira, sir, Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, SJCE, JSS Science and Technology, University, Mysuru, for sharing the knowledge and experience on different NDT methods available and adopted to evaluate quality, strength, and durability of hardened concrete. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to VVCA management and our principal, Dr. B. Sadashiva Gowda, who always been a great support behind such events. Thank you, sir. It's a matter of immense pride for me to convey my gratitude to our HOD, Dr. S.K. Prasad, for his continuous support and motivation in conducting such events. Thank you, sir. I, always, uh, I also thank uh, the coordinators of today's webinar, Professor Rajiv TJ and Professor Girish P. Thank you, sir. I would also like to render my gratitude to the organizing committee members and moderators, Dr. Ramesha PK, Professor Arjun V, and Professor Anjan BK for their kind support. Thank you, sir. I would also like to render my thanks to all my fellow colleagues, technical and non-technical staffs who helped in conduction of this event. Thank you. And lastly, I would like to thank all the participants for their kind cooperation, and we look forward to see you all for our next webinar on advanced water and wastewater treatment system. At 11 a.m. on 17th August 2020 by Dr. B. Manoj Kumar, Professor and Head, Department of Environmental Engineering, Sri Jaicham Rajendra College of Engineering, JSS Science and Technology University, Mysuru, in view of birthday celebration of Dr. Rajendra Singh, Waterman of India. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you.